One, two, three. So, so welcome everybody and good morning and thank you David for the, for the nice introduction. I'm, I'm really very honored to be here and, uh, and by the way I missed one year I must, um, I must confess so I'm, I was only here for, uh, for, for, for nine years. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm really glad to be here. Uh, welcome everybody in the room and everybody uh, online. Um, my uh, presentation will be about decoding complexity. It is about um, let's say some more challenges that go beyond the, the, the technical challenges. And um, <clears throat> let me start with a, with a thing because I was uh, involved in um, um, say many roles as an, as an systems engineer. Um, I was uh, volunteering a lot. Um, I was the INCOSI deputy or was the INCOSI technical director for, uh, for two years and also served as a volunteer um, was about a student prize for the German chapter of, uh, of INCOSI. So I, I, I read a lot of publications on, uh, on systems engineering. And uh, these days I was involved in the INCOSI systems engineering handbook and in uh, the update of ISO 15288. And um, <clears throat> very often, of course, when, when it comes to systems, systems engineering, it is, it is about complexity. And um, all of these publications that I, that, I, that I read and that I went through, well, I say, all started kind of the same way. Yeah, so if, uh, I have a few examples for you. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is from the Incozy System Engineering Vision 2035 that, uh, that Ralph will be presenting then in the, in the afternoon. So the vector of systems engineering will further evolve to support the demands of ever increasing system complexity and enterprise competitiveness. Okay, so um, what else? In the Incozy Systems Engineering Handbook uh, version five, it is our world and the systems the engineer continue to become more complex and interrelated. Okay, goes goes in the same direction, and I thought maybe look up because Incosi has got an uh, Incosi uh, complexity working group, an international working group, um, and there uh, it says <clears throat> few systems engineers would doubt that complexity is increasing every year, and uh, maybe even better, the complexity of systems uh, continues to increase to unprecedented levels. So that's more or less the liberty. The drama queen version of it, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> that is from ISO 15288. So in many of the other publications, and probably you've read, also read some of them, um, they all say, "Wow, complexity is increasing." Okay, good. So, well, what kind of what, what kind of complexity are we are we talking about? And um, so let's go back to the to the very basics. And uh, one of the uh, the publications that was. Um, uh, that, that was approved and published while I was the INCOSI technical director was the update of the definition of systems engineering and systems. So the so-called INCOSI fellows, which is a, which is a group of um, <clears throat> say, um, a very, very experienced systems engineers on the INCOSI level, uh, they were given a task to update the definition of, uh, of systems engineering because the, so to say the former one, which was still in the version four of the handbook, Wow, it's very, very long and very bulky, and it's 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 pretty hard to communicate to others. So uh, the task was set, and uh, I said it was um, not really uh, too many expectations, but in, in terms of time, so. Um, <clears throat> but of course, the, the team it took them one and a half years to come up with an with an updated definition. And um, <clears throat> the first thing that they found out is that they fundamentally disagree what a system is. And said, oh, okay, that's uh, that, that's tough, yeah. And so they they started discussing a lot, and this was then their the, the end result, yeah. So that's the incozy definition of uh, what a system is. It's a system is an arrangement of parts or elements that together exhibit behavior or meaning that the individual constituents do not. So I was also trapped. Let me say, I was as I was acting more or less as a as a manager. I read these uh, three lines and said, Phew. and this is the result of one and a half years. And um, I've had a team, of course, they were experienced systems engineers. They've met many managers before. And I said, David, we knew you were asking this question. Yeah, so here's another 900 pages of documentation that we got uh, together with that. So there's a lot more behind it. Um, in case that you're interested, it's available for free on the INCOSI website. Uh, <clears throat> uh, very cool stuff. And um, just maybe to give you, so to say, which is also important for the rest of the, the presentation, is why did they fundamentally disagree what the system is? Um, because they said we got different worldviews. And by the way, they, they said, wow, we, we really we would have loved, because you Germans, you got a wonderful word for that, yeah, which doesn't really exist in, in, in English. 
which is a Weltanschauung. Yeah, so maybe those of you who speak German, yeah. So that's that's the say, that's the term they say, wow, this is a really good one, and it really doesn't translate one to one into English. So anyway, they had different worldviews, yeah. And one of uh, some of them said, for me, a system is is, is just <clears throat> many um, software modules. Yeah, you put them together. Yeah, so we follow this definition here. Yeah, so it's a <clears throat> set of uh, an arrangement of different uh, software modules. You put them together, <clears throat> and all of a sudden you have some behavior that you cannot see from the individual constituents. Okay, some other said, uh, for me it's something like a car or train or plane or something. Yeah, it's, it's some hardware elements, software elements, mechanical elements, <clears throat> and uh, you put all of that together and then you got a system. Well, fair enough. Uh, the third worldview was, I said, if we look at the, in, 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 in nature, we have got something like, uh, like natural systems. Yeah, these are also systems, we're talking about an ecosystem. And uh, <clears throat> also here we got some elements, yeah, and uh, then we got some 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 behavior, yeah, that is uh, that is shown as soon as they, you put all these elements together. Uh, the fourth one was <clears throat> you can look at organizations, yeah. You just think about your organization, your company. That also is an is a system, yeah. You can treat it as a system. It consists of certain elements, and probably all of your your, <clears throat> your companies have some like a mission or vision statement. Yeah, so that's the purpose of this system. And then the fifth one finally was uh, a bit more forward looking because I said, um, <clears throat> what about self-learning systems? This will create some new um, or, or um, some new approaches. Yeah, for example, when it comes to verification, yeah, today's, today's rate, how to verify a system, you have a certain input, yeah, then the system does something, yeah, then you measure the output and check if this meets your requirements. So, but now what happens if this output changes over time? Uh, what about your verification? Yeah, what about your verification results? Are they still valid? So therefore they said this is the fifth system, a fifth type of system. And, uh, and again, yeah, so if, you, if you're interested in, in, in more detail, yeah, read, read that material. Uh, there's some, there some uh, a management summary, a few pages only. There was publication made out of it. Yeah? And, and again, if you want to read the full-blown version, there's a link to a website and you got something like 900 pages yeah, with all the all the results that they found. So um, <clears throat> then I thought about myself and said, okay, about complexity. Um, I'm now in the, in, the, in the business for for a little bit more than 20 years. Can I confirm that that systems have become more complex in that, in that over the last 20 years? So I was asking myself the question: What was the most complex system that you were ever involved in? I just give you a half a minute or so and. And that you think about what was the most challenging project or most challenging system that we were, you were ever involved in? What showed the most complexity? Oh, it's not, not that hard. So I <clears throat> try to remember, okay, what were the systems that I was, that I was involved in? So it all started with this wonderful project here. Yeah, that's the A400M aircraft. Uh, I was part of the team <clears throat> for four and a half years developing the emergency oxygen system. Um, <clears throat> I just smiled a little bit when David said about some success stories and some Maybe some failures um, because this was my starting project, and of course I, I learned a lot, yeah, which which means that we as a team we did a couple of mistakes, yeah. So that's uh, uh, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, a great product today. Um, another project I was involved in, maybe here from Switzerland. Some of you may, may know that that's Miles Plus. It's the military um, air traffic management system, an update. Um, also, kind of a success story, so to say. Um, maybe some, some, uh, some, also some, some more mistakes in there. Uh, just as an example, because it was an, an off-the-shelf equipment, or the idea was to get an off-the-shelf equipment from, uh, from, from Germany. Uh, but there were some voices uh, at the beginning of the project that said, mm, you maybe cannot directly translate it from, from Germany to, to Switzerland. And then at one point in time, they, they, they figure out, yes, we have some difficulties, because uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, the, uh, the landscape is somewhat different, yeah, because it's, it's a lot more dense, uh, which means that all of a sudden they had some tracks on their monitors, which they couldn't see, hey, where, where are they from, yeah, because it was very close to the, to the airport, but they had no idea, there was no aircraft and nothing, and finally they, uh, they found out that it was uh, near, in the nearby mountains, it was the cattle, yeah, with their huge uh, things around the neck, yeah, this was what they detected, yeah, with this uh, with the air traffic management system. Um, another system I was involved in was for the uh, for the Royal Netherlands Air Force. Yeah, it was a reconfiguration of a couple of their very old aircraft. Yeah, so this one here is an that's uh, an uh, a DC-10 and the 11. I don't know exactly one of one of one of those. Um, and uh, and another system 
uh, the military submarines. So also pretty, pretty complex, yeah, all those, all those systems. I was, well, I was involved in all of them about the past 20 years and said, hmm, but maybe I must admit there is, there is one, one other system that is by far more complex. And this is this one here. So this is me and my family and our dog. Yeah, so, and uh, this is a, a picture we took, I guess, someone, someone last year. And, uh, and I want to say a special thank you to, to Jacob. He's the one at the, at the, right, at the front right-hand side because he was suffering muscle pain that day and he had to stand like this uh, for, for a couple of minutes. Yeah, it was, that was really hard for him. So um, I also, I'm teaching systems engineering in, um, I'm giving, giving trainings on systems engineering certification and, uh, and a couple of other courses. And uh, there is one, one exercise where we ask people, hey, what, is, what are the typical challenges in your, in your projects? And what is the kind of consistent approach that you can, what you can take to, uh, to mitigate those? So very often I call it something like the group therapy, yeah, because uh, uh, typically we have people from different uh, companies attending, and uh, and then you have a group of four or five systems engineers. They come together and say, "Okay, what is what is their, what is what is the most challenging thing in your in your in your projects?" So um, number one, so to say, or one of them that comes up very often is about interfaces. It's either internal or external interfaces are somewhat unclear or changing over time. Um, <clears throat> so this, this, this can be very challenging. Unclear requirements. Oh, I guess there are some, there are some projects out there that have unclear requirements, yeah, which also seems to be very, very popular. A, few, a lot of teams struggling with unclear requirements. Limited resources. Yeah, so we're giving some a deadline. Yeah, there's some like we don't have unlimited budgets. Yeah, this, so this means we have limited resources, which prevents us from, from gold plating, but what we like a lot. Uh, the next one is new technologies. Of course, there might be some emerging technologies that we haven't fully understood, which can be very challenging. And unrealistic schedules. Well, also here, yeah. So we have uh, we have no idea, and sometimes our schedules are prepared uh, by people who do not have to do the task. Yeah. So, by the way, this is one of the twenty-five unwritten laws of systems engineering. Yeah. Another uh, another one of those uh, I would say must-reads for every systems engineer. It's uh, uh, it's 25 unwritten laws, and one of them, uh, nothing is impossible for a man who doesn't have to do it. So if your project manager puts together uh, the, uh, the, the schedule for writing a piece of software, probably his estimate is completely different from the, the estimate from your software engineer. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, so that present, that uh, introduction or this, uh, this publication is from 1994, I guess, and it's still valid. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> shame on us. So, and another one is inadequate staffing. Yeah, so your people are not, 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 not properly trained either on the tools, on some methods or, or, or whatever. So these are, so to say, this is very often what I, what I, what I see and what I hear when, uh, when it comes to, those, uh, uh, to this exercise. And of course, uh, there's many more and we can ask ourselves the question, how many of these are technical? No, because we as systems engineers, we are very well educated in solving technical problems. But what about these ones here, about these, these major challenges that people face in their, in, their, uh, <clears throat> in their projects? So we will come back to them a little bit, a little bit later. Maybe one other approach. Um, then also I found, found ones because I was, um, <clears throat> um, I was say my, my early days, I was working a lot as a systems engineer. I was involved in developing systems. And, uh, and of course, um, <clears throat> I had to say, Dealing with all of these uh, these challenges here, more or less, yeah, and not in, in one project with uh, with all of them at the same time, uh, but over time uh, you get some 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 interaction to that. Uh, then I was also involved in some other projects, which was about <clears throat> reorganizing companies. Yeah, so so again, one of the um, uh, one of the systems you can you can think about is an organization. Uh, we can restructure organizations, we can improve their processes and and things like that. So what else there? Oh. So <clears throat> what you typically have is something like a bit what you call the change requests. Yeah, so this, this one here is taken from examples. So an example that we use very often on our training programs, it's a smoke detection system, which consists of several components. Yeah, you have the, the smoke detector itself. You have something like an alarm unit. You have the smoke detector uh, and a sensor, so to say. Uh, you have a control unit and you got some power supply, yeah, which is either from the main system or then um, I say it's a backup, you have, you have a battery installed. So 
So then all of a sudden you find out, oh wow, the power supply from the building or ship or wherever, wherever the smoke detection system is installed, that's that's good enough. Yeah, we don't need any 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 battery within our system. So safety wise, reliability wise, there's no there's no issue. So we can just <clears throat> we can we can think about how to how to treat this one. Yeah, and we can just delete it. Yeah, at the same time, but of course, on the right hand side, we see that we got something like an <clears throat> a setup, an organization chart of this whole project. So what happens if you now cancel the, the, the battery? Well, of course, you have to, this, this person is no longer needed. So who cares? Does the battery care when it is removed from the system? No, we can ask the battery and say, oh, it doesn't answer. What about the engineer? If you ask him, hey, you will be removed from this program. He's got an opinion or she's got an opinion about this. And uh, <clears throat> so therefore, I found, yes, there are different types of system, but the way to treat them might be completely different. Yeah, so the people, they react in, in, in certain ways. And that is something that we, as systems engineers, that we've considered. Now, let's take one of these, these typical challenges. Yeah, so I ask you, so many of, how many of these are technical? And let's pick one of them and say, okay, let's talk about unclear requirements. And like, let's take this one as a, as a challenge. Is this technical? Oh, it's about it's about technical requirements in many many cases. Yeah, right. So <clears throat> we all sort of say we've all learned a lesson. Yeah, we've uh, we've read ISO and ISO standard on requirements engineering. There's the Incosi handbook giving wonderful introduction on how to treat that. There's another publication about 477 pages or so on needs requirements verification validation. So all of the wonderful stuff. Yeah, and uh, just. Maybe just a short version, yeah, not introducing the four, more than 470 pages. So there's, an, <clears throat> uh, there's so to say, um, uh, some characteristics uh, for a set of requirements. So it must be complete, consistent, feasible, comprehensible, able, able to validate it, and correct. So, so far, so good. Yeah? So this is derived from the ISO standard on, on, uh, on requirements engineering. It is in the COSI handbook. It is in the uh, assistant engineering body of knowledge. Yeah? So, so to say, it's uh, throughout. Um, all of these, all of these documents, you can you can read it. So again, so we're talking about technical requirements, yeah, and we're talking about stakeholder requirements definition, and they must be, they must um, meet all of these characteristics. There are some of them that are, or all of them are challenging, yeah. So this uh, this this for sure. Uh, in the projects I was involved in, I found one of them extremely challenging, um, which is which is the second one, which is the consistency. Of course, when you, when you read those requirements, very often at the beginning, you can see, okay, there's, there's, there's some conflicts. Yeah, you can identify them more or less immediately. Okay, system shall be blue, system shall be red. Okay, this is a conflict, yeah? So there's no, no doubt about that. However, uh, when you dive deeper into the details, uh, there might be some conflicts that do not surface until you do at least a certain, uh, certain analysis. Uh, for example, I was once involved in, in a, in a smoke detection system, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> we had some difficulties uh, to to meet the safety requirements, yeah, in order so that the probability to really to detect the fire was was not good enough. So, what can you do in order to bring this number up? Well, get more more sensors into the system. Yeah, so we installed more sensors. Yeah, which definitely improves the probability to detect smoke. So then we were happy because we then we uh, we met this requirement uh, and then we analyzed a little bit further on and all of a sudden we discovered oh uh, as soon as we add more sensors there's another it has an impact on another performance characteristic uh, which is the reliability of the system which means the more sensors you got in your system the higher the probability for a false alarm so now we were fine on the probability for the uh, to detect the, uh, the smoke but it was not okay. We did not meet the um, other requirement for the uh, for the for the false alarms. So we had to remove some of the, the sensors again, so to say. So this is <clears throat> this is just one example, and probably if um, you've also come across this point that you <clears throat> that you think, oh yes, we're doing pretty well in terms of the consistency, and then you do some further on analysis, yeah, more and more detail, and suddenly you find out, oh. There is still something more, yeah. Which means not all of these conflicts are very obvious. Yeah, it may happen that they uh, that they do not show up. That uh, <clears throat> and they shouldn't show up immediately. So 
how can we ensure that all of these these are these are consistent? And at the beginning, in particular, when we talk about stakeholder requirements, we have to reach out to all of the stakeholders and and ask them for their expectations on the system. So let's uh, let's do that. Who do we need to reach out reach out to? You? So this is about a diagram that I also share very often in my in my trainings in order to to emphasize. Okay, this is this is pretty complex. We have a lot of different roles involved in in, uh, in 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 a project. And by the way, how many of them are technical? <clears throat> so what about you? You're trying to elicit your technical requirements with this group. Yeah, let's say we've got a smoke detection system, and let's take one example: a DK nursery or so. Who of these um, <clears throat> um, stakeholders involved is happy when you? You interview them, yeah, then you get a lot of information. Uh, then you put everything into a 50, 60, 70 pages requirements document, yeah, with these nicely worded things, and you hand it out again to all the stakeholders. What happens? Yeah, are they really happy when they read a 70 pages requirements document? No, not really. Yeah, so they about the end users, wow, parents, the kids themselves, yeah, uh, the people working there, they have no idea about requirements engineering. So that's uh, that's probably not the way. So, and, and by the way, all of them are conflicting. Yeah, so when you ask three, four, or five stakeholders, yeah, they won't, they, won't, they won't share the same opinion. So therefore, systems engineering is about managing all of these conflicts. Yeah, it's about bringing all, all, these, all these folks together and uh, coming to, uh, finding a good technical compromise for all these competing um, expectations. Um, by the way, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm also in some of my projects, I'm partnering with, uh, with Dave Walton, another very experienced uh, systems engineer from the United States. And he came up with the uh, with the saying that says, um, if all of these experts yeah, and all of these people involved, and if they not all of them are at least a little bit annoyed by you, yeah, you as an assistant engineer, you did a poor job. Yeah, you really must you must challenge them, yeah, in order to find this this, this compromise. We're going to come up with an optimum. So we've we've learned that, right? Yeah. So there's uh, about solving technical uh, technical conflicts. So there's something that we that we call trade studies, trade-off studies, or so on. Yeah, we have we have all kinds of uh, mathematical approaches in order to uh, to treat that. Yeah, we've learned a lesson well. Uh, we know a lot about um, uh, FEM and, and and a lot of other techniques that we can use. Yeah, in order to uh, we have uh, we have we have modeling languages and and so on. There's there's a couple of things that we can that we can do. And of course, we also share um, the opinion that we need to treat it very very early. The earlier we find those conflicts, the better. Uh, if they are discovered too late, okay, there's a situation something like this. Yeah, so all of a sudden, yeah, this box opens, yeah, and you see a lot of crap coming out of it. So, therefore, uh, again, there's great stuff out there. For example, yeah, have a look in the new version of the of the Inkosi handbook. Yeah, there's some there's some chapter about this um, um, all of the systems engineering analysis and methods. Yeah, it's about modeling, analysis, simulation, prototyping, traceability, interface management. Architecture frameworks, patterns, design thinking, uh, biomimicry, yeah, really, really, really cool stuff. So this is something that we that we've learned. Yeah. So again, I'm I'm, I'm teaching those courses, and uh, <clears throat> I'm really all of the time. It's really amazing. Yeah, about the level of knowledge that, that people bring when they come to those uh, to those trainings. Uh, very often, they are much more familiar with all of these techniques than I am. Um, at the same time, um, very often, so the reason why they're attending these trainings is but they, uh, I'm, I'm also teaching and I'm working for a couple of years with one company. Uh, they once found out <clears throat> uh, they had systems engineers in their in their company, and uh, they had a yearly meeting or every one and a half years. Uh, they had a so-called systems engineering expert forum, which means it gathered all of their systems engineering experts, yeah, in one single place, yeah, from all around the world to talk about systems engineering topics and how to um, um, get better. In these in these systems engineering analysis and methods, and in one year um, <clears throat> they discovered because they made, they made a little survey and they said, okay, we're we're here the systems engineering experts from this company. Let's make a little survey and then ask their systems engineers, how many of you have attended a systems engineering training? Yeah, they were all very well trained in requirements, in architecture, in analysis, in system L, in whatsoever you name it. But how many of you have actually ever attended a systems engineering training course? Uh, there were about five or six different uh, departments were, uh, were on site. 
Uh, there was one in the leading position, they had 10% of their systems engineers were trained in systems engineering. Uh, second place was another department, 6%, and for the other one, it was zero. So none of them ever had attended an, a systems engineering training. Yeah, again, excellent systems engineers, but not necessarily on this sort of saying this overall level. So then, then of course, they saw a huge uh, training effort and so on. So now the situation has become much better and uh, they are in, in a pretty good shape. Yeah, I guess we're doing these trainings now for five, six years. And it's, it's, it, it's one, again, one of those uh, success stories. Yeah, because uh, as a trainer, I know uh, I'm, when I'm visiting this, uh, this company, I can see that some of the, the ideas yeah, that, uh, that are presented in this training course have now turned into reality. Yeah, so they, uh, like a concept of operations and operational concepts. Yeah, they you know, do something like that, which was completely unknown couple of years ago, which is, uh, which is, which, which is very great. So therefore, again, we're, we're pretty good in that. And um, we also know that there's, that there's some enablers yeah, that we need to, it's not only about those technical issues, but there's also some enablers for solving this, this, uh, these technical conflicts. So you can have the very best engineers in the world, but as soon uh, or as long as this is not given, uh, you probably will fail. Yeah, so one of them, of course, is front loading, as, uh, as mentioned before. Yeah, so try to identify and solve those conflicts early. Yeah? Identification is the most important thing. Yeah? Knowing that you've got an issue here is already a good, a good, good thing. Communication and networking. Yeah? Always make sure yeah, that your people talk to each other, uh, which is not a given for, for engineers, by the way. Yeah? So when you're in a leading position, please always remember your people to talk to each other. Yeah? That's... Uh, and also encourage your people, yeah, just like what we do here to network. Yeah? And, and today's, with today's challenges, uh, challenges and in this complex world, it is almost impossible to find a, a good solution by just thinking about it yourself. Yeah? Try to network a lot, try to get a lot of, lots of opinions in order to come up, uh, come up with good ideas. The environment, the leadership is important. Yeah? So the uh, an atmosphere in which conflicts can be solved in a constructive manner. So please be aware that sometimes the manager may ask, hey, three lines of code for in one and a half years, that's, uh, that doesn't sound good. Yeah? So be pre-prepared yeah, to sell yourself and say, wow, yes, but we've, uh, <clears throat> we've investigated 999 other ways that don't work. Yeah? So this is what we did in one and a half years. And then finally, holistic view, challenge your biases and patterns. There's also a nice chapter in the, in the Incozy handbook. So this part has improved significantly from version four to version five. Yeah, so it's all about, so we all have, we all are biased. Yeah, we have our patterns. We try to reapply our patterns over and over. Um, we cannot really avoid it because we all have our past history. And, and, and we as humans, we are, that's, that's, that's also very good yeah, that we can make intuitive decisions. Um, <clears throat> on the downside is that very often if our patterns are no longer up to date, we might be completely wrong. Uh, just as an example, I showed you the, the picture of the A400M aircraft at the beginning. So this was the very first time that the Airbus company, Airbus company built a military aircraft. Wow, there were some things that just went wrong. Yeah. So for example, uh, I was part of the emergency oxygen system and we, we, simply, we simply overlooked that we have an, an, a mission that is called high aerial delivery. Uh, which means um, when you, those of you who, who flew into Zurich, yeah, so I flew in yesterday evening and I was, at, I was listening to, this, uh, to the safety instructions yeah, on board of the aircraft, yeah, which says, okay, in case of decompression or loss of cabin pressure, yeah, don your oxygen mask. Yeah, so cabin pressure, that's the first, first fault, and then oxygen mask doesn't work, wow, then you're in trouble. Uh, but it's always a double failure. Yeah, loss of cabin pressure, and the other one is the oxygen system doesn't work. So what happens? So this is true for any uh, um, civil aircraft. Now we're entering the military world. And, uh, and again, we got some missions. Yeah, one of them is, uh, is high air delivery, which means at maximum flight altitude, which is 40,000 feet, 13 point something kilometers, you open the ramp. Yeah, so you decompress your aircraft on purpose. So there is not a, it's not a double failure anymore. So the, the fate of the whole aircraft and all of the passengers on board is now in the oxygen system. And of course, we as engineers, yeah, our, our team lead, yeah, he had more than 20 years of experience in oxygen systems. Very experienced guy, really wonderful. Oh, okay, that's something that's, uh, that was not, uh, uh, not in his patterns. 
Yeah, so he was he was biased yeah, by all the systems that he has built over the past 20 years. So therefore, be, be, be very, very careful about this one, because many of us have a lot of years of experience, and please challenge your experience every time. Uh, those of you who have got kids, yeah, you're used to that. You're doing that more or less every day. Yeah? So my kids are challenging me uh, qu quite hard. Yeah? You saw them, three boys. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty tough. Yeah? <clears throat> anyway, yeah, you really have to, uh, have to do that. So um, from all the examples that we, that we saw before about conflict management, so what is, what is, what is that? So we know, okay, we have, we have no idea how to solve those, those, those technical conflicts. But I guess from the introduction or from the slides before, I gave you some, an idea. Oh, it's not only about the technical conflicts. Now, when we have, when, we, when we're approaching all these stakeholders, they all have technical expectations on the system. But many of them with a non-technical background, yeah, which means that we have to approach them in a slightly different way. So can we really just apply all of these wonderful techniques that we have learned also to solving technical or non-technical problems? So who of you has engineered his uh, relationship yeah, to, your, to your wife, to your spouses? Yeah? Have, you, have you built up an, a system L model for that? Have you, have you applied all of your engineering analysis to, to do that? Oh, I see one yes, yeah. <laughs> Very proud, yeah, cool. <laughs> no, typically, no, we, we, we do not, yeah. So there's some other ways, yeah. We, we, we all find our ways through. And there's a lot of um, these decisions that we take throughout our, our whole life. For example, with, uh, with my kids, yeah, the, the oldest one, he's now about to leave school. Wow, huge decision. What about what to do after school? Very little, little experience. You know, there's not too many patterns that he can that he can that he can that he can use, so to say. Um, of course, kind of biased by maybe friends and of course by by, by parents and, and and others. But wow, it's a huge world out there, right? So there's many different jobs that you can do, and uh, and of course, also I'm I'm biased. I have my own patterns, yeah, and I can say, wow, I can I can recommend. Let me say this area, this area, but there's little at least hundreds, maybe even thousands more, I, I have no idea. So therefore, yeah, this, um, uh, there are situations that, that we are all facing more or less every day, and, uh, and, and we're coming to, to good conclusions, not necessarily applying our, our, uh, our technical approaches. So let's make a, a very, very simple one, a very simple conflict. So um, I say this, uh, this nice picture here shows that these two folks, they definitely got, got, an, got an issue, yeah, because they fundamentally disagree. On, on, on what they're seeing. So who's right? Mm. No, it's, it's a question of perspective, right? As, uh, as, uh, as often. So and now we're entering, so to say, a theory of, of, of conflict management, yeah? Just, but only touching the surface, yeah? So there's, there's some types of conflicts, yeah? So it's intrapersonal, interpersonal, intergroup, intergroup. Yeah? So it's a, what, kind of, what kind of conflict is that? Okay, intrapersonal. No, it's not with only with one person. It is between two different two different people. Yeah, so it's probably the second one, interpersonal. So this is what we're talking about here about. So um, this one, this is, a, this is an easy one. And what about the causes of conflicts? It's about task. It's is it about relationship, or is it about values? Oh no, they're given a task. Yeah, so they're given a task to read what is what is right in front of them, and they disagree on on uh, so they say on on on, on the results. So who's got an idea? How can we how can we solve that? So is there an, is there an engineering approach how to solve that? Ah, maybe turning this whole thing around or what's ever, yes, yeah, so making it visible, yeah, and taking the other perspective. So we got we got several ideas, yeah. But typically when I ask my my, my students in all of these training courses, hey, how can we how can we solve all of these uh, these non-technical conflicts? A lot of question marks out there, yeah. So none of them really really know. And um, there's, there's, of course, a couple of wonderful approaches, yeah? like, like, like problem solving, collaboration, confronting, we got compromising, uh, reconciling, we got withdrawing, avoiding, forcing, competing, smoothing, accommodating. So um, now again, the question, is that part of our systems engineering trainings? No, in most cases, it is not. Yeah? Uh, the, only, the only exception that I know, um, <clears throat> I say it in, in also about... Uh, no more than, than 10 years ago, uh, the German chapter of INCOSI set up a certification program 
uh, that had a mandatory uh, two days training on um, on soft skills, yeah, so communication, and uh, and for the for the more advanced one, yeah, also uh, conflict management is, uh, is 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 part of that. So, and um, I really found out no, we cannot really treat them the same way. Yeah, there are differences between them, and even worse. Um, Remember again the situation yeah, in your company when you're having those, those, uh, those, those non-technical conflicts and the other parties that are involved in, uh, let's say, project management, uh, controlling um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, sales departments, are they trained in conflict management? Yes, in most cases they are, yeah? so which means that we are in a, in a, very, a very difficult situation. Yeah? So we're trying to solve conflicts with them. And they have a very good idea how to solve those conflicts, and they are trained in that area, and we are not. So, which means that we're, in many times, we're not, not, not on the same level. And I've seen it over and over again. Maybe some of these uh, situations also sound familiar. So there's, um, <clears throat> there's an engineer, a really bright idea, and absolutely convinced that this is a good solution. Um, Presenting this idea uh, to management doesn't automatically mean that management will follow this opinion. Because in many cases, we as engineers, we, 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 we tend to overcomplicate things. We cannot really express ourselves in very simple words. Um, it, is, it is pretty hard yeah, to, 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 um, to express all this complexity in, 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 in an easy language or easy to understand language and to get the point across. Yeah? This is pretty hard. So this is one of those things that I that I learned that are, that are extremely um, um, important. Uh, one of the experiences from from, uh, from, from, uh, from projects I was involved in, it was on wind turbines when one team was uh, was uh, investigating for one and a half years um, how to build up a new class of wind turbines for the I guess it was five megawatts was the target, and um, they investigated for one and a half years uh, to go uh, to to reach that goal with maximum reuse of the existing parts that the company already had. So that's not a, that's not a trivial task. Yeah? So they were investigating it for one and a half years. And uh, tons of calculations and, and analysis behind it. Yeah? Then they approached upper management. And then the CEO looked at this whole thing and said, three blades? Why three blades? All of my wind turbines have two blades. We're going with two blades. So he was more or less just with this one sentence, yeah. He was killing, yeah, the one and a half years of work, and of course they ended up with only four point six megawatts. Yeah, it was not possible to five with only the, the two blade solution. Yeah, that was uh, that was not doable. So whose fault is that? Of course, you can always say you can blame the, the, the CEO and say, "Wow, he was just ignorant." Yeah, but wasn't it also the case that we failed with we as engineers failed to get our point across? Okay, uh, maybe situations was, was probably more complex, but, but again, yeah, so very often what we just saw, when there's a conflict, please always try to look that the truth might be somewhere in the middle. Yeah? It's not always about right or wrong. So now as a, as a reminder, yeah, so these are, these are typically the, uh, the challenges that we're, that we're approaching. Yeah? It's about interfaces, anti requirements, limited resources, and so on. At the beginning, we clearly say, wow, in interfaces. Yes, this is this is technical. Yeah, this is about power supply. This is about um, safety and security levels at the interfaces and, and and a lot of technical stuff. But always remember when you're talking to your counterpart and the and the uh, on interfaces, there might be conflicts beyond the uh, the technical challenges. Yeah, and very often that is the case. Yeah, the same is true for the unclear requirements and so on. Yeah, new technologies. Wow, it's not only technical. Yeah, there are some desires behind it. Uh, that come from a non-technical area, which means <clears throat> that uh, here's some of these challenges. We first of all we think about them in a technical way, uh, but the same way we have to think about wow, there might be there's definitely in all of these projects there's something beyond technology. Again, we're dealing with people. Yeah, it's not that we're just removing one battery from our um, uh, from our from our diagram. It is about it is about getting in touch with people. So therefore. What are the key aspects of, of a successful lead systems engineer? Yeah, so when I say that's the, that's what I always see. So of course, I guess no brainer is knowledge of the discipline of systems engineering. Yeah, you have to know about you have, you have to do your homework, so to say. Yeah, you have to go out and get the tools, methods, and and approaches. Yeah, which which ones do work and which ones do not in certain certain situations. Knowledge of the domain definitely helps a lot. Yeah, so 
I can say that I, uh, I, was, I was working as an external uh, throughout my whole career. And uh, all of a sudden, I was introduced in the automotive industry. And from the systems you saw before, it was more defense and, 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 and aerospace. And um, I was acting there as a requirements engineering coach. I was, I was there as a so-called expert. And I was sitting in all of these meetings. And I, for the first two weeks, I had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah, it was German. Yeah, I could understand very easily. Yeah, but I had no idea. Yeah, they were talking about something like an A sample, B sample, C sample. Never heard of that before. Yeah, if you're from the automotive industry, you say, oh, that's pretty common. Yeah, no, but uh, if you're from the military world, yeah, it's about uh, preliminary design review, critical design review, and, and those things. Yeah, this is the language that I was used to. Yeah, then I, and the, the, uh, the medical domain, yeah, for them was uh, uh, design input, design output. So, ooh. Okay, yes, all of that is logical, yeah, and it's uh, it's pretty good. It, and, and after you understand it it's, it, it's it's pretty cool. But if you're sitting in those meetings as an expert, yeah, for the two weeks and you have no idea, well, that's not, not a comfortable situation. So finally, you have to you have to know your organization. Yeah, you have to know what about what are, where are all these communication channels? Yeah, where do you have to uh, where do you have to go in case my, my my funding is not approved? Yeah, are there any other alternative ways? Yeah, to uh, to go through that. And you already see that number one is missing. Yeah. So number one is an appropriate soft uh, set of soft skills and uh, and disposition to systems thinking. Yeah? So system thinking is another um, really Im important thing, but also the soft skills. Yeah. And it's um, <clears throat> it is not only about the technical things. So therefore, uh, so the key takeaways yeah, from, 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 from this presentation. Yeah? So first of all, most systems are complex. Uh, first of all, I'd say that all systems are complex, but uh, maybe there's some that are only complicated or some of them are, are rather, rather trivial. Um, it is about managing conflicts. You know? So systems engineering, uh, we're facing technical uh, conflicts and a lot of others um, throughout the, uh, let's say, every day. Uh, please always understand the environment or context. Yeah? This is about your biases. Yeah? Please understand all these, uh, these connections to the outside. Uh, they are relevant. Uh, networking and communication is also another, is, is also key. Yeah? Please get in touch with uh, uh, as many as people as possible. Just use this day here today, not only to listen to all these presentations. Yeah, there's a lot of breaks um, <clears throat> throughout the whole day. Uh, enjoy the lunch break and everything uh, in order to get in, in touch with people, talk to each other, make contact, and uh, gather some ideas. It will uh, it will help. And then finally, do your homework. Yeah, which means reach out to your to, to your boss and say, "Wow." Well, it's not only about all these technical trainings. Um, I also want to get involved or learn a little bit more about these, these, these non-technical areas. Uh, in particular, when you're working in a role of a lead systems engineer, uh, you sort of see you're moving a little bit away from technology and you're getting more and more exposed uh, to, this, uh, to this level. That's also my experience. This, from this perspective, I can say, yes, for me, the systems I was involved in over time, they become more and more complex but not necessarily because of the technology, but more um, because I was involved on, a, on, on higher levels, which means not only responsible for one tiny part somewhere down in system architecture, uh, but more on the, on the higher levels. And the more and more you get exposed to, the, uh, to these non-technical conflicts, and this definitely increased by far uh, the, the, the complexity of the system as I was involved in. Good, so I hope this, um, this triggered some thoughts. Yeah, um, I want to thank you um, for, for for listening. I open to answer some questions. And before that, wish you rest a wonderful day. And uh, if you got any further questions, please get in touch. Thank you.